and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, Vice-Chancellor of Sydney University, Michael Spence. Labor member for Jellybrand in Melbourne, Tim Watts. The Global Head of Diversity at Australian software giant Atlassian, Aubrey Blanch. CEO of the US Studies Centre, Simon Jackman. And West Australian Liberal Senator, Linda Reynolds. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Tonight, vigils around the country have been held in memory of Eurydice Dixon. The young comedian was raped and murdered as she walked home through Melbourne's Princess Park last week. Police urge women to take responsibility for their own protection, sparking a storm of protest on social media and public debate on safety. Our first question tonight is on that topic. It's from Jacinta Fermanis. Thanks, Tony. Um, I suppose following the events of the last week or so and in terms of the longer form narrative around the safety of women, uh, this was important to me to highlight that not only myself, but I feel I can speak on behalf of many women, um, that we do have situational awareness. We do carry our phones home with us in our hands. We do carry our keys like a weapon. And we are, in fact, aware of our surroundings. Um, and yet, <laughs> you know, we are followed, we are stalked, harassed, abused, raped, um, and in this instance, murdered. So to suggest, you know, the situational awareness narrative needs to continue is nothing less than victim blaming. The only other step we could take as women would be to simply stay inside, um, <laughs> curtailing our own lives massively. And even then, we would still be in danger because of the mass amount of women who are abused and harmed by the men within their homes. Voices of authority should be condemning the perpetrators, not the victims, in this case and any and every case that should follow. And unfortunately, they will follow. Is this the murderous version of boys being boys? And what is the solution? Aubrey Blanche, I'm going to start with you. I know you've just flown into the country a few days ago, but this is a, a global problem. It is a global issue. And I think I first want to say I can't even begin to imagine what Eurydice's family must be going through right now. But if there's any bigger tragedy, it's that this isn't a unique situation. Like you said, I've lived through it. When I was in college and I was raped, I didn't go to the police because I didn't trust that I would get anything but being re-victimized. I thought that I would be blamed, that they would ask me things like, what were you wearing or were you drinking? instead of questions that might have helped them solve the crime. But if there's anything that gives me a little bit of hope, it's that 10 years ago, that would have been the end of the story. But now what we see is this incredible backlash. We're living in a post Me Too world where women are standing up and our allies are standing up and we're saying enough is enough. I can't sort of let it go that you just said there that you were raped um, mm -hmm. in college. I, I don't want to go through the details, but can you tell us how you managed to, well, first of all, how did that happen to you? I mean, were you alone? Were you walking alone, for example, as Eurydice was? No, it was probably, I mean, one in four women on college campuses, right? This isn't a unique situation. I was at a party with friends and I had had a couple of drinks. Um, and it was very clearly someone who had offended before, which is usually what happens, right? Because our culture and our society is not even predicated on stopping these things, but in so many ways, it's actually built to create them from tolerating the blokey jokes about domestic violence to the way that we build our institutions such that they protect the abusers instead of the victims. This is a part of our society, and I think it's time that we've had a reckoning on it. And what about... The, the part of that question that asked whether this is boys being boys, but a kind of hideous, um, murderous version of it. I mean, on some level, I take offence to the idea that we have such incredibly low standards for men, right, that they can't help themselves. I mean, we see in the world that, right, men tend to be running business and government and things like that, but does it make sense that people that have that much power should also be that completely unable to control themselves? No, I think the answer is that, like you said, we raise the standards for the way that police deal with these things, for the way our institutions respond, and frankly, for the way that we treat people who abuse others, right? There has to be a social cost for these types of things. And it's time that we truly start believing the victims. Michael Spence. 
I think the really revealing thing in this um, space is that when terrible things happen to men in public, nobody ever says, well, men should be looking after themselves. Um, this is clearly a situation where for a very long time, people have been blaming victims and it's got to stop. It is, as will be suggested, a deep cultural issue and, and, and what makes me proud as an Australian is that people across the country this evening came out in force to say, actually, we're not going to be a part of this. We're not going to have this anymore. Um, we've seen at our own university colleges that when you get, um, we brought Liz Broderick in to work with our colleges to think through these sorts of issues, and that when you get people imaginatively engaged, actually, the men want to say enough as much as the women. And so I think there is a possibility for change in this space, and it begins with the kinds of demonstrations that we've seen this evening. Is there something intrinsic in the culture, in our culture, in men's culture? Um, that's what the questioner is alluding to at the end there, that perhaps there is. So I think there is um, a, 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 over all cultures for a very long time, there has been a disparity of power between men and women. And I think we are now at a point at which we need to say, actually, that's simply not acceptable. And both in the ways that it takes violent expression and in the ways that it takes more subtle and insidious institutional um, expression in the kinds of, um, of hidden biases that there are across workplaces, across schools, across institutions, in governments. And we know that it's got to stop. Tim, uh, you're from Melbourne, 15,000 uh, Melbournians. Uh, came to the vigil in the park uh, for Eurydice. Um, but of course, there was a dreadful incident overnight where, where some lunatic decided to put um, sexualised graffiti all over the area where she was raped. Yes, I mean, that, that, that vandalism uh, was symbolic, Tony, of this backlash you see. Um, it, it's extraordinary for me. I've been involved with this issue since I entered Parliament um, after a particularly horrific... Uh, murder of a woman in my electorate, not someone who was walking home late at night, uh, someone who was going about their day-to-day -day business on the main street of my electorate at lunchtime in front of hundreds of people. Um, and you see this, this instinctive kickback from men, this desire to say, oh, well, not all men. Like, I, I ne am ne not violent to men, therefore this issue has nothing to do with me. Um, but gender equality is something that has to do with all of us. Um, yes, all men, no men who are violent towards women. We know this because of the prevalence of it in our society. Um, yes, all men shape the behaviour of their male peers. Um, and yes, all men can fight those gender stereotypes. I mean, you're talking about Princess Park. The last time I was at Princess Park um, was for the Western Bulldogs AFLW team uh, winning their first premiership. Um, I was there with my daughter cheering on Ellie Blackburn and Katie Brennan, um, who didn't play but, you know, was there in spirit. Um, and they're the kinds of transformative moments we need as a society because that shows everyone the equality of the genders. It transforms football clubs. It shows not only my daughter who could go there to cheer on her heroes, but my son who will grow up in a society never knowing that there was a time when women didn't play footy. Um, that's what we need to be promoting in our society. Linda Reynolds. Mm. Look, there is no excuse for violence against women or men and violence is a crime and the fact that the police instinctively warned other women to take appropriate care was, I think, well-intentioned, but it was so misguided because it sends absolutely the wrong message out to the community. It was not her fault. It was the perpetrator's fault. And all Australians have to be safe when we go out into the streets. We have a long way to go. And as the Prime Minister says quite regularly, and I think he's right, is that disrespect to women starts from a very early age. And we all see examples of that in the community. And not all disrespect leads to violence, but all violence starts with disrespect. And this just reminds us again as a community, we've all got to stand up, we've got to stop looking past it. And every single one of us here in this room has a role to play to end this violence and have more respect for women. Do you have any sympathy for the notion that there, there may have been playing out here some murderous version, as the questioner asks, of boys being boys? That is certainly a cultural norm that many young men still grow up with. And you will, we saw some ads last year, I think, that were very powerful, where young men were starting from a very... You know, boys were starting with um, really terrible attitudes to young girls and young girls were growing up used to that behaviour 
and young boys just thought it was normal to have those attitudes to men. So it really does start in the home in terms of respectful treatment for everybody, including particularly women. Simon Jackman. I'm still struggling with the juxtaposition of mm. murderousness and boys being boys. Mm. I, I just makes no sense to me at all. Just reflecting on your remarkable statement, Aubrey, um, coming back to Australia from the United States, um, I'm intensely aware of, you know, what's happened on American college campuses over the 20 years I was in the United States. It's important to also for Australians, I think, to know the United States has, um, in, in federal legislation, Title IX of, of the federal code, makes it a civil right for a woman to be able to get a college education. And anything that happens on a university campus that gets in the way of that attracts the attention of federal authorities. We're not talking about a police matter necessarily with respect to the criminality, right? But that will escalate immediately to become a civil rights matter at the federal level. And if you want to keep getting federal dollars for your university, you have to comply with that legislation aggressively. You have to demonstrate to the feds in the United States that you've got procedures on the books that take any, any allegation of, of sexual assault incredibly seriously. And I can't help but wonder um, if the Australian Parliament might think about elevating uh, a protection for women in various parts of Australian society, but perhaps university campuses might be a good place to start to that level, a demonstration of how seriously we're taking the issue here in Australia. So i quickly go back to our question, if I can, and um, you've listened to that. And look, I get the sense, listening to your question, uh, that you're just simply completely fed up with hearing or reading about stories like this or hearing about them in the community? Absolutely. Um, this is one incident of many that we see time and time again. Um, myself as a 20-something-year-old woman, you know, it really did occur to me over the last week that I walk home 10, 15 minutes in a residential area when there's not that many street lights, and I have my keys in my hand and my phone in my hand, as I just mentioned, and that is a reality for everybody. And I do appreciate very much that there is currently a discourse happening around the incident and we're all outraged and that's awesome and that's really good. But it feels very momentary. Um, and I suppose as well, you know, delving further into this topic, it's funding cuts. There's very little action being taken. It's all very verbal and it's very... Um, it feels a bit superficial, I suppose, only because I feel like, and alongside many other women, I'm sure, in the room and out there in Australia, it could be me. And if it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. And real action doesn't seem to be going anywhere. That's a powerful final word for uh, that part of the discussion. Uh, thanks, Nicinda. We'll leave you there. We'll move on to our next question. We've got plenty of questions to get through. This is from Lucy Kavanagh. Linda Reynolds, the Liberal Party conference held over the weekend voted to privatise the ABC. Why do you think this is a beneficial decision when the ABC is the most trusted news source and broadcasting corporation in Australia? If it was privatised, how would you guarantee its independence? Linda. Well, Lucy, thank you for that question. And look, the Prime Minister's made it very clear that the ABC won't be privatised. And I was there at the conference over the weekend and I heard the debate on the motion. And from my, from my perspective, I think it's not so much about privatising the ABC, which is not going to happen, but $1.2 billion of your taxpayers' money goes into the ABC every year. And I think that it is quite a valid thing for us in Parliament and for, you know, for all of you to actually question, is that money being best spent? So, for example, I'm from the state of Western Australia and I hear frequently from people in rural and regional areas in Western Australia that they don't feel that they get enough service from the ABC. So, in fact, Tony, I would love Q&A to come to Western Australia and come out to uh, and hear from, from Western Australia. You might have to increase our funding just a little bit, Linda, because uh, <laughs> Tony, that's one of the I think, problems we face. <laughs> Tony, I think $1.2 billion, you can find... You can find a few dollars. It's a big organisation. Seriously, how many years has it been since Q&A's been West? Six or seven years? No, we'd love to do that and uh, write to well, the managing director and see if they can as, find the money in the diminishing budget. And come to, come to Port Hedland and out to the Pilbara where 40% mm. of our nation's wealth is generated and probably 40% of your salary, Tony. 
comes from Western Australia. So come west, we'd love to love, to, it's not love for, for you to it's hear not from Western Australia. Trying, so where do you think this is coming from, though? Because it's not happening in isolation. Has it been a mounting uh, series of criticisms, particularly from the Conservative wing of your party, and now a call voted on uh, by the council it was, uh, it... to privatise the ABC? First time I can recall that happening. Yeah. Well, look, it's a, quite a valid debate. And again, because it is a public, uh, publicly funded organisation, as I said, $1.2 billion. Is it a valid a debate to privatise the ABC? Is that well, it, it's a valid question. And I think it's a good thing for, for all of us to debate where our taxpayer money goes and are we getting best value for money? And in terms of the strategy of the ABC being so focused now in uh, city media markets, like here in Sydney and Melbourne and Adelaide and Brisbane, is that really best value for, for Australians? And people in rural and regional Australia would say it's not, but it's certainly a valid question for us to ask. Tim Watts. <laughs> well, Tony, the ABC is a precious national asset. Um, in an age of uh, weakening democratic institutions, fracturing media markets, the ABC is that rare beast where all Australians come together across the ideological spectrum to consume the same content, to have the same debates, to talk as we are here as citizens. Um, in, in a context of declining democratic institutions, that is so precious. We should be defending it at every opportunity. Unfortunately, the motion that we saw at the Liberal Party Federal Com Council on the weekend, um, it's not an isolated incident. Like, five Liberal Party senators have spoken in favour of privatising the ABC before. I mean, this sounds insane, right? It sounds like a crazy idea, but this is the mainstream of the modern Liberal Party. There was a time when Conservatives cared about institutions. They cared about, um, you know, our, the things that we needed to sustain a democracy. Now, um, it's just uh, off-the-shelf ideology from America. They know they can't get away with privatising the ABC, Tony. So what they'll do is they'll start slicing the salami. We've already seen, despite the promises of no cuts to the ABC that Tony Abbott made as opposition leader, we've seen two rounds of cuts to the funding of the ABC. We see a Minister for Communications uh, who spends more time sending complaint letters to the ABC than he does de dealing with complaint letters about the NBN. Do you accept that one of the problems we face here is that as soon as this issue about the ABC's future becomes politicised, um, and obviously you're speaking in passionate terms now. It sounds like one side of politics supports the ABC and the other side doesn't. You got it, Tony. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll let true. you... That's um, true. This is true. I, I don't, I actually, if you want to protect the ABC... I don't believe that is true, Labor. Tim, to be honest with you, but um, let, let's just quickly hear yeah, from Andrew. Their actions speak for themselves. And, look, Tim, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the fact that the Liberal Party has uh, taken all our policy and ideology from America. It doesn't actually make sense. But in relation to Tony's question... The ABC is a great national institution and it performs a really important role. But that said, it is still publicly funded. And what we want to do is, like we do with any other organisation that's publicly funded, is keep challenging it to make sure that it is still serving the purposes for which we fund it and for which we require. So just very briefly, come back to that point. Um, are you saying it's a legitimate debate Absolutely. whether within the government, whether or not the ABC should be privatised? Absolutely. Uh, it is, it, no, it's not to say the government will do it, and I think the Prime Minister and the Minister for Communications have been very clear that it's not going to happen. But we should never be afraid of debate in this country, whether it's about the ABC yeah. and about our other institutions. And this is one of the things I think we're going to talk about further, but we should never be afraid of the debate. And if the answer is, at the end of this debate, that the ABC is fulfilling its mandate and is doing the best it can with the resources that taxpayers give it, fantastic. But just to say that it's a, a Conservative issue or a Labor Party issue, I think does a, a severe injustice, not only to the ABC, but also to all Australians. I think we are absolutely capable of having a mature debate about our public broadcasters. Well, Ollie, okay. I'm keen to debate that every day to the next federal election. And isn't debate the point? Isn't the point that in a country particularly of this size, you need a public broadcaster that can balance out the debate, a public broadcaster on which a variety of views are represented in the kind of way they are in the ABC? Mm. Michael, I mean, it's not unique um, to find institutions suffering from threats to their funding and so on. Uh, universities have faced that. You've faced it at your university yourself. I mean, do you see this as part of the politicisation of institutions in Australia? So I think there are interesting choices being made about resources. And I would say that both universities and the ABC are national treasures that need protecting. You know, we are, um, if you believe this week's rankings, in the top 0.25% of universities in the world. For a country like Australia to have six, seven, eight universities of that kind of calibre is really quite extraordinary. 
and accounts for, in part, the quality of our civic life, that we have institutions like the ABC, institutions like quality um, educational institutions that can keep our democracy going. And those things need treasuring. Simon Jackman, uh, let me get you to reflect on uh, this as someone who's worked in the United States yep. as well, because they don't have a public broadcast, or at least they don't have a pu publicly funded one. They have one that works on subscription and donation. Um, the, the really interesting thing about listening to this debate is reflecting on how the American model of public broadcasting is very bottom up. It tends, and PBS tends to be a network of local public television stations. Now, there's good news and bad news in that. It means there's an awful lot of local community input into what makes it to air in that, in that uh, particular market, but you're dependent on the resources of that market. And what happens in rural and regional areas in the United States? You know, Boston has a you know, WGBH, where I lived in the Bay Area, uh, KQED. Fantastic public broadcasters. But what happens once you get outside the big metro areas of the United States where there are deep-pocketed philanthropists willing to fund public, bro uh, public broadcasting? Mm. Um, and so that would be my... It works, it works on, a, on a, uh, a seasonal basis. They set aside a week uh, for raising funds and they don't do anything else much except for... Uh, basically asking the public to donate. So you get these whole weeks each season. Uh, uh, yes, at least twice a year. Yeah, they, they interrupt program. They're, they're, sh they're rattling the can uh, to stay on the air. Can you imagine the ABC doing that, Linda? Uh, no, I can't, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. But don't forget, Tony, we've also got community radio and community TV here in Australia that are partially uh, government-funded but also self-funded, and they also provide a really important community voice right across this country. So... I should give a shout out to our wonderful community radio and TV stations ac across the nation because they do sometimes get forgotten in the debate. And the question for Simon is, would the quality of American public debate be better if there were a publicly funded broadcast? I'm actually just going to ask Aubrey that. What do you think? I mean, it's, it's hard to judge, obviously, but um, do you think that the media landscape in America, that politics will be different if there was a public broadcaster? I think, I think that's something that would, the, the obvious answer is yes, right? We've seen the fracturing of American media and especially on the more conservative side of politics, right? We've seen a general distrust of, right, the MSM, the mainstream media, to the point that you see such polarization that we're basically living in two different worlds on the other sides of the aisle, right? Um, I think there was a great piece. It was like red timeline, blue timeline on Facebook. And just trying to imagine if you hold a different set of political opinions, all of the information you get either comes from a different filter or is just utterly and completely different. And so that coupled with the fact that the kinds of American institutions that used to allow people to mix across political lines, things like unions and bowling clubs, they really just have declined, right? Union membership is at, I think, an all-time low. And so what we're seeing is people who simply have no experience interacting with people from the other side of the aisle, which the fact is, in order to find a middle ground, we have to see people as people first. And we don't, as Americans, have a lot of opportunities to do that, um, right? It's so easy to otherize people that we disagree with, um, which means that we can't find those points of compromise. Yes, imagine Q&A in America. But we'll just leave that, we'll leave that imagining uh, to move on to another topic. We've got a lot of things to talk about. This is one of the biggest stories of the week. The next question is from David Walton. Thank you, Tony. Um, US President Trump, who has limited experience in Asia and no background in armed forces, stated at the recent summit press conference in Singapore that he would, at one, be looking at removing US troops from the Korean Peninsula when possible, and two, intended to end provocative war games in South Korea. This has sent shockwaves throughout the region, and in particular, South Korea and Japan. Despite reassurances from, Sec uh, from Secretary of State Pompeo, members of the uh, State Department and, and Pentagon, the inference is clear. Allies must build, up, must build up their own defense capabilities in a period of growing Chinese ascendancy and face the possibility of the US eventually withdrawing from the region. And my question, has Trump started the new order in Asia, in the Asia Pacific? What are the implications for traditional allies such as Australia? Simon Jackman, we'll start with you. Um, it, was a, it was a huge week, and it's a great question, David. Um, we've been reflecting on it 
um, deeply um, out at the US Study Center. Um, in one week, in addition to the, to the Singapore summit, there's also refusing to sign the communique at the end of the, the G7, which became a G6 communique in effect, and, and also starting um, uh, tit-for-tat trade uh, tariffs uh, with China. Um, that's a pretty good threefer. And, uh, and insulting <laughs> a traditional ally in Canada to right. uh, an extraordinary degree. If, if, if a US president did just one of those things in one week, it'd, it'd be momentous, but, but Trump has done three. Um, and, but your question's going in exactly the right direction. When Trump came to office, our scholars out at the US Study Center, we, we settled on, as did many people around the world, that Trump's foreign policy would be transactional. And we didn't really know what that would mean, but now we do know what that means. It means he is prepared to cast aside some of the niceties and traditional forms of, of conducting foreign policy for the deal that's on the table in the moment, perhaps irrespective of the character uh, and the history of the person or the country that he's dealing with, that he's prepared uh, to insult uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, a Canadian uh, Prime Minister, one of America's closest allies. What's becoming clear is that Trump has no sentimentality for what we in Australia routinely call the rules-based liberal international order. Um, he will do what, what feels right in the moment as well. There's this incredible... Trying to make sense of this is hard because you've also got to understand he is winging it a lot of the time, right, and isn't tethered in that moment of policy improvisation by that strong commitment to those foundational norms of how American foreign policy and, indeed, how the US alliance system... But it does raise a question as to whether those, those norms um, were, in a way, making it more difficult um, to achieve peace with an enemy. Um, the, the phrase we've been working with all, all week out at the study centre, if it took a Nixon to go to China, did it take a, a Trump to go to, to Pyongyang? Which he didn't. They went to Singapore. But, but, but the idea, it takes someone with that improv improvisational approach to foreign policy making, like Trump, t to get the ball moving here. Now, where are we going to land? Well, you're right in your question. He, it has upset allies. That took a lot of people by surprise, that announcement. That, uh, to be sure. It also can't help but validate the strategy that the North Koreans pursued, and that is, if you acquire nuclear weapons, ultimately you're going to end up sitting across the table from the President of the United States with a negotiation about sanctions coming off and a normalisation of relations in return for what? Promises that we are committed to a path towards denuclearisation. And so the big question is, for allies, as, as, your, as your question indicates, so where does this leave us? He, he wings it in the moment. He seems to have no built-in, he's not sort of underpinned um, by this strong commitment to the rules-based international order. And so for Australia, that's, that's, that's the game, right? We are a middle power. Why do Australian foreign policy leaders, Penny Wong, Julie Bishop, why do we constantly talk about the rules-based international order? Because that is big countries behaving themselves of their own accord, binding their hands. Australia does well in that environment. How will Australia fare in a world where big players are doing deals with one another? The alliance system is, is being, is, has less relevance in contemporary foreign policy. Where does Australia come out at the end of that? Simon, Where does Japan come I'm, out? I'm just going to interrupt you there because we've got another question on this. There's someone with a hand up there. Keep your hand up because I'm just going to go to our next question first on this topic, but stay with us. Um, and we'll go to our next question. It's from Alex Lee and we'll hear from the other panellists. Alex, go ahead. Hi. As a current Australian, it was a mind-blowing experience to see two leaders from the US and North Korea got together and do the handshake for the peace. And in my opinion, it was a great start for two countries who have been enemy to each other for the last, last 70 years. However, many foreign analysts and the media seem very skeptical of North Korea's summit's results because of its lack of details. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a, this is a fair call? I'm going to come back to you in a minute, Simon. Sure. I'm going to hear from the other panellists on this. And Michael, <laughs> let's start with you. Um, 
So my wife is Korean and we have, uh, my parents-in-law live with us and we have the Korean news on more or less constantly. And um, I don't know whether or not you watch it, but I don't think commentators in Korea can make any more sense of this than they can here. I think the important thing for Australia at the moment is that in a very shifting global environment, we have a very principled foreign policy and that we keep good relations with both the major players in our region and in the world more generally. And that's why for us, some of the careless talk about China, for example, has um, been so concerning over the last little while. So I think the Korea situation is confusing, but there's a lot about the world that's confusing at the moment. And just clear principled positions from Australia are very important. Aubrey, I'm going to bring you in, then we'll hear from the politicians. So, I mean, this is an extraordinary moment for Trump because he's under fire in the United States. This may be his greatest moment so far of his presidency, but will it go anywhere? Well, I think that's the question. Um, I think the most terrifying phrase I've heard ever is policy improvisation. Um, but the thing is that diplomacy, especially around things like denuclearization, is a long-term delicate game. And what we see not only is that Trump is often not prepared um, to have a, a policy strategy on this, but he's also decimated the long-term ambassador core of the State Department, meaning that there are very few people advising the administration on how to proceed forward with any sort of coherent policy, whether or not we're happy with the fact that we've just taken basically the largest strategic pivot in Asia since 1979. He did have, actually have some sort of public relations team produce an extraordinary video which seemed to kind of rewrite the whole nature of diplomacy because it was like a kind of propaganda video saying this, these are the riches that you can have, North Korea, you know, high-speed trains and whatnot, if you only come with me, Donald Trump, to the new world. <laughs> I mean, I look forward to seeing the papers in uh, the APSR about the apprentice-style foreign policy strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, uh, I'll just go back to the person who had a hand up. Go ahead, uh, quick question, and uh, we'll go on to hear from the politicians. Hi, I was just wondering, um, with... Trump behaving so erratically and a lot of commentators seeing that America may be a declining superpower. Do our politicians maybe think it may be time for Australia to align ourselves with a different power, perhaps China, as they are rising in our economy at the moment? Good one. We'll pass that over to Linda. Um, your foreign minister, our foreign minister, Julie Bishop, was pretty tough uh, in her assessment of this. She, was. she told uh, Donald Trump to keep his foot on the throat of the North Koreans, um, implying, I think, that he'd taken it off. Look, I have a slightly different perspective on Donald Trump. And yes, I think that he is dis disruptive. And you know, some of you have called that erratic. But I don't necessarily think that is a bad thing in the world today in terms of what's happening. Because let's face it, he has got further than any other president has in the last 20 years in terms of communicating directly uh, with the North Korean regime. Now, I would be stunned and amazed, and quite frankly, I cannot see um, anybody on the, on the Korean Peninsula taking, stopping exercises and actually taking forces away until the North Korean regime, till Kim, uh, Kim Il-jung actually un, says that, yes, you can come in, you can verify, we are starting to demonstrably uh, stopping processing you know, plutonium and uranium. Uh, we're starting to dismantle our ICBMs and we are truly denuclearising the Korean Peninsula. So we've got further now than we have, but uh, North Korea have form in this over 20 years of broken promises. But I think that it is a very good thing that he has got it this far in his own very unique uh, way. But in terms of what it means for Australia, I actually think it's not necessarily a bad thing for Australia and we are very respected because we are party to the armistice in, in Korea, on the Korean Peninsula and it could be a good thing for us and in terms of getting involved and if it's successful, all the better. But I think Julie Bishop is right to be, be quite cynical and cautious until we see action from North Korea. And just to answer that uh, question there, you don't think that Australia should be looking for a new ally? Absolutely not. Tim Absolutely Watts. not. Tim Watts. Look, I agree with uh, Linda Tiny that uh, you'd want to see some real action before uh, the, the West took uh, responding action. So you want to see uh, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearisation before we take any irreversible steps. Uh, now, military exercises, they have been suspended in the past in response to the 94 agreements. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm relatively relaxed about if it's in exchange for 
for action. I think there is a broader point that needs to be made here, though, um, and that's that you know, Trump uh, attracts a lot of attention and people get very worked up. Um, but we're in the middle of a much bigger change in our region. Um, the geostrategy of the Indo-Pacific is something that's been evolving uh, for some time now. Um, I had the bracing experience of speaking at my old high school recently at their awards night um, 20 years later. Um, and it struck me then that when I was in high school, Francis Fukuyama was talking about the end of history. You know, that we cracked the model of uh, geostrategy and that it was all about basically managerialism, that we, you know, we had the model, it was liberal markets, it was uh, open societies and, you know, Polly's jobs was just to sort of, you know, turn the dials every now and then. That world is gone. You know, and I said to the, the graduating high school students, there's good news and bad news there. You know, the, the bad news is, is that the, the range of potential outcomes is now potentially very scary. You know, the world that Australia is in from a strategic perspective is much scarier than it was in the past. But also on the good news front is that we can shape those outcomes ourselves. Now that is a challenge for Australia. I don't think we're meeting that challenge yet about making our own way in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, I look at the fact that today, fewer Australians are learning Bahasa Indonesia than when Gough Whitlam was Prime Minister. There are 10 million more Australians than when Gough Whitlam was Prime Minister. But our immediate neighbour to the north, a country that will be one of the four largest countries in the world, a significant strategic power, we're less interested in it today in a time of danger and change than we were 40 years ago. That's crazy. We need to get match fit. We need to get in the game. Simon, uh, yeah, I'll come back to you, Linda, but uh, I did promise to come back to Simon because I cut him off um, to <laughs> go to one of those other questions. And, um, of course, our uh, South Korean-Australian uh, questioner there uh, basically said that um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of promise yeah, uh, out of this? I mean, do the Allies just have to suck it up and <laughs> wait and see? Well, yes, the Allies do have to suck it up and wait and see. Um, we want to we see those signs that, that Tim was talking about, that there'll be some, some, some verification and that Trump's commitment about stopping exercises, we're getting something for that. I, I don't, I don't want to take away from the silver lining here that it was historic that these two men met, but it came at the end of a campaign of maximum pressure, it was called, right? And we had China helping as well. Right? And now, that have we backed off too soon, number one? And number two, I think we also have to celebrate the fact that it's much harder to launch missiles against someone that you've just met. And that, for now at least, that talk of fire and fury from last year, we're not there right now. That's a fact. And that's, that's got to be a, a good thing. Where we end up on this one, though, a lot of work to do. And potentially a lot of downside at a systemic level as well, mm -hmm. uh, that, we, that a country like Australia needs to be very mindful of. Uh, Linda, I'll just give you the final word on this. Brief, brief one if you can. Pick up that point about whether we should uh, abandon our uh, traditional allies. And I think now is the worst time to move away from our Liberal Democratic allies. We, we have fought with them over for over 100 years. They are our friends in the United States, the Great Britain, um, New Zealand and Canada. They are the people that we have most in common with and they are the ones that we trust. They trust us to protect them and we trust them as well. And I don't think we should ever, despite you know, difficulties we have from, from time to time, but Tim is right. We've got our old, our old traditional allies who we trust, but we've also got a lot of democracies in our region, Indonesia, Japan and our wonderful friends in Korea. So we've got old friends and we've got new friends and I think we need to embrace them more than we ever have now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question, very different subject, from Lily Campbell. Hi, um, my name's Lily. Um, I'm part of Disarm UCID and I'm a member of Socialist Alternative. The multi-billion dollar Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization is offering millions to Sydney University to offer a Bachelor of Western Civilization. In the words of Ramsey Centre board director and infamous racist Tony Abbott, the proposed course is not merely about Western civilisation, it's in favour of it. The centre has been heavily criticised by Sydney University academics who have described the centre as purely European supremacy and see the centre as a major threat to academic freedom. I don't think that universities should be propaganda machines that are available for purchase by the highest bidder. I think it's pretty clear to anyone paying attention that the Ramsey Centre billionaires seek to whitewash colonialism and promote racism and war. It's Western civilization, after all that has killed over a million people in Iraq. 
So my question is to Michael Spence, will you be following uh, ANU in turning down the Ramsey Centre offer? And just before we go anywhere, uh, Lily, you went off piece from your uh, questions you proposed to us by suggesting that uh, Tony Abbott was a quote unquote infamous racist. We'll simply say we don't believe that to be the case and there is no evidence of it. And we'll move on to the question. Please, Michael Thwaites. Um, so I think it's important to uh, talk about where we are with the Ramsey Centre. Um, we've clearly said to them, as I've said to Academic Board at the University, um, we won't uh, run a propaganda course of any kind. We don't think that a course that evaluates the contribution of Western civilization makes sense, nor indeed a course that compares civilizations. Um, but there is on the table the opportunity for support for study in the humanities. And we have an extraordinarily rich tradition in the humanities, 147 units of study in what you might call core Western civilizations. We fought hard to keep minority subjects alive, like Old Norse and Middle Welsh and Old English. We have a very, um, a, a very uh, successful classical philosophy department. And so if there's an opportunity for funding for study in the humanities, that's a conversation we've got to have. And the question is, on what terms would be prepared to have it? Yeah, Michael, can I interrupt there? Because um, this is where uh, it came a cropper with the ANU. Tony Abbott has said that a management committee, including the Ramsey CEO and also its academic director, uh, will make staffing and curriculum decisions at the centre. This was too much, it appears, for the ANU because it seemed to rob them of their independence on staffing, on curricula and so on. So, I mean, are you prepared to give up those things at Sydney University? Um no, so we would not be prepared to do that. We're not prepared to have um, uh, 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 anybody outside of the university um, curtailing the academic freedom of the university, either in relation to the recruitment of staff, the recruitment of students, or the content of course, of the course. What we are saying to the Ramsey Centre is um, if you want to fund a um, course at the university that goes through all the normal procedure process, uh, approval processes with the 120 academics on academic board, um, then, and you want to give us that money, then come back in five years, have a look at it. If you want to take the money away, then we'll make the decision as to whether or not we keep running the course. Um, but, you know, next year we predict, um, uh, crossing our fingers, that we will pass the $1 billion mark in our current fundraising campaign. Um, so we are certainly not going to sell our souls for a particular gift and academic freedom is our souls. So what about the notion that Tony Abbott once again said the proposed course is not merely about Western civilization, it's in favour of it? In other words, that there should be some kind of positive bias uh, within the course if you accept it. Is that something that a university would accept? So you don't, um, uh, it's not the case that the Ramsey Centre has a course that would be slotted into the university. Again, that's not something we'd agree to. The course um, that we have talked about with Ramsey as a kind of draft of the sorts of things we might do, but obviously this has to go out to consultation with the academic community and all the rest of it, is a course developed by academics at the University um, of Sydney. And it's a, a great books course, much like the great books course that we have, that um, uh, uh, yes, um, looks at the great texts of the Western tradition and there are tremendous intellectual resources there that we already explore at the university. Um, none of that is particularly controversial. So, and if they pay you money to do it, that's all the well, as um, far as you're concerned. Is that what you're saying? No. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is um, we are, uh, we're about to hit the billion dollar mark in our fundraising okay, right. campaign. Okay. We are used to working with all sorts of philanthropists. Okay, so there's small Throughout it, we pickies. protect that's academic freedom. Let's, let's move on uh, to hear... John Howard and Tony Abbott and this board that's filled with racists and right-wing propagandists, like clearly they have an extra bias and that's definitely going to have an impact on what's taught at the university. OK, because once again, I'm going to interrupt you because you are claiming people are racists, racists it's defamatory, uh, we're not going to allow it. So let's move on. Simon. Um, I um, started my academic career at the, at the University of Chicago um, where great books is compulsory, including for the faculty. Um, I taught statistics in the morning and taught liberalism and its critics in the afternoon. And it was the best two years of my education, my first two years as a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, that commitment to teaching the Enlightenment and critics of the Enlightenment 
is what makes the University of Chicago one of the world's great universities. It is a place where arguments are happening. It is hand-to-hand -hand intellectual combat. Bring your A game to campus every day. If there's some money out there that can help transform Australian universities to make them intellectually intense places where this great debate that's been going on for centuries in the Western tradition, if we can institutionalise that or put it on a firmer financial foundation, then please can we find a way to do it. Australia is going through, is asking itself some really good questions. Let's ask an obvious question though about that. Is it a debate uh, if you approach it uncritically? Uh, because there seemed to be a suggestion from Tony Abbott this is in favour of Western civilization. Does that mean, and it's hard to really judge what that means, but um, some suggest that it means you're not going to look at or critically at Western civilization? I, I, I think part of the Western Enlightenment tradition is how to be critical. Mm. Mm. Critical in the modern sense of it, how to be scientific in the modern sense of mm. that term, how to bring reason to bear and to mount arguments that advance the course of human dignity. That's not a left-wing thing or a right-wing thing. Mm. That's a human thing. The Enlightenment is one of the great accomplishments of the species, and we ought to be throwing our arms around it, and if people want to put that on a, on a firmer financial foundation and an Australian university, please can we find a way to make that happen? We've got to get across the line on questions of autonomy and academic freedom and integrity. But this is a great opportunity. I hope that someone out there, um, the Ramsey Board and, and Michael, I hope it comes to the University of Sydney, um, I hope it goes somewhere in Australia because this is what the country needs um, at this moment in its history when huge questions are being asked. I was going to ask to bring, to bring uh, Audrey, Aubrey in here. Yeah, so I actually fundamentally challenge the idea that, and again, Australia, like America, is becoming a more multicultural society. Is what we actually need more looking at the lens of the world through the Western canon? Right? The fact is the majority of history has been written by the colonizers and the conquerors, right? who have driven the narratives of people like where my family's from in Latin America. I think if we're talking about universities being the bastion of places that are helping people think critically about the future, rather than thinking about bolstering the traditions of, I'm super curious how many of those great books weren't written by Europeans, and, right? And it's why wouldn't we be investing in creating decolonialist narratives that are sharing the types of narratives and stories and histories that we haven't seen because we're living in a globalized world where everyone is more interconnected. And I think especially for folks who are steeped in the Western tradition, what they need is actually narratives outside of that. Um, okay, Michael. That's <laughs> the suggestion is that what we're what you might be looking at is the colonizers version of events. So I agree with everyone. Um, like, <laughs> the, the University of Chicago is ranked in the top 0.25% of universities in the world, just like us. Um, it's a great place. We explore um, all sorts of traditions. This is not actually an entire bachelor's degree that is being proposed. Right. It is a stream. So it will be possible to do this great books course um, as a stream in a BA and then to do queer studies, to do Islamic studies, to do um, uh, 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 Chinese studies, to do whatever it might be alongside it. Um, these are interesting intellectual resources with which we grapple every day of, of the week in the university. And it's possible that there might be a bit of cash to support that work. That's no bad thing and we've at least got to have a look at it, subject to the normal processes for approving um, academic courses at the university, which involve 120 of our academic staff and some students, and also subject to the, 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 the absolute 100% preservation of our academic autonomy as an institution. Got another question on this, and now I'll bring in the politicians to answer this. It's from Jack Abadie. Good evening. Dr Spence, I'm a first year student at the Sydney, uh, University of Sydney, and I'm already getting involved in student politics, as you do. And Whilst I disagree there is a full left-wing uh, bias on university campus, I do feel like in more lectures it does turn towards that sort of ideal than it does towards the right. Do you feel like denying the Ramsey Centre's uh, offer could be an impediment to maybe balancing the discussion on campus? And before we come to Michael, I'll go to Linda. And you can answer both the questions. Thank you. 
Isn't it wonderful that the Ramsey bequest has actually resulted in this discussion here today? We are actually discussing texts and books and ideas and philosophies, you know, several thousand years old in some cases. And so I think it is, it is a wonderful bequest. Yes, there's got to be some details because ultimately it was Western civilization that gave birth to academic freedoms, to universities, to individual freedoms of thought, speech and worship. So there are some, you know, there are some good things that have come out of that tradition. But we should have more bequests like that so that everybody who studies at university has the opportunity, as the, as, uh, you know, the VC has said, is to understand all of these traditions and to have these arguments and have these debates. Because ultimately that's what universities were for, were for, is academic freedom, but also freedom for students to explore these philosophies and these concepts and to work out what is relevant to us today. Alina, do you think part of the impediment here is we're looking at it through a political um, frame, um, partly because, mostly because Tony Abbott is deeply involved in pushing the idea, but we've got left and right questions here in the audience. Um, it does look like politics has reared its ugly head. If Tony Abbott wasn't involved, would we be having a different debate? Well, we are having a different debate and uh, like it or not, because uh, of these comments with Tony Abbott and how they've been perceived by the ANU, we are having these, this national debate today. So it shouldn't be an issue of politics, it should be an issue of thought and embracing different ideas and different concepts and how different religions came to be and what they all, they all provide us today. And I don't agree with Aubrey just on this. I don't think it is just an issue of post-colonialism or things in, in, in our recent times. It is much, it's much richer than that and I commend the university for looking at this and providing the opportunities for students OK, let's hear, from, uh, let's hear from the other side of politics. Tim. Uh, so, Tony, I, the way I sort of look at this is I, I'm all in favour of Western civilisation. Very interesting. Love a good debate, love a bit of critique. But the thing that most interests me, interests me about the Enlightenment era philosophers are the mistakes they made. Hmm. You know, most of them were social Darwinists. You know, they believed that the races were not only different in character but in competition with each other. Um, and that was a really powerful uh, intellectual debate that shaped the founding of Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a reason why the White Australia policy, the Immigration Restriction Act, was the first act of parliament passed by the Federation Parliament. That thinking fed directly into the founding of our nation and our, our sovereign birth. That's something we can learn from today. Like, why did these philosophers who had these fantastic ideals, who had these great ideals, mm -hmm. get it so wrong? You know, in a multicultural society that we live in today, that's something we can all learn from. Now, we only learn from it, though, if we're allowed to engage in critical inquiry about these philosophers. If this is a cheerleading course, they can go and do it at the IPA, frankly. They're barking at the wrong institution. All right, but if it's critical debate, I'm all for it. Let's, let's let Michael it. respond to that and, and to the question that was asked directly to you. Go ahead. Um, so I think you have to be careful about how you choose your units of study. There is almost no political opinion um, uh, that is not in some way represented at the University of Sydney. Um, there is almost nothing that um, we do not study, all with the same spirit of critical inquiry. And so it is inconceivable that we would run a propaganda course. Any course in Western civilization is going to have to ask questions about what does it mean to talk about the West? What does it mean to talk about civilization? Um, what, uh, what, what, uh, how of these texts that are being dealt with, what have been their social implications? What were the contexts of their production? And these are inevitably going to be um, difficult, um, challenging, extending conversations of exactly the kind that should go on in a university. We don't do propaganda. We're not going to do propaganda. But if there's money on the table to support some of our work in the humanities that is just so rich, then we would be extremely foolish not to be talking to Ramsey about it. Um, we'll leave the subject there and move on to another question. Ruby Zup. Hi, Ruby. Thank you. Atlassian is the Australia's top tech company. However, only 26.9% of workers there are female. What is the diversity team at Atlassian doing to increase female workers in the tech industry? And what can our generation do to ensure diversity in all workplaces? Aubrey, one for you. That's a great point. And, and the fact is, it's not good enough. Um, so if you look back 
uh, a year from when that, that statistic is uh, current as of August 2017. The year before that, that percentage was actually 25%. So you'll see that the gains year over year are pretty big, and we'll be releasing a new report later this year. But the fact is, we're doing a whole heap of things because this is a complicated systemic problem. So we've raised our hiring standards. It turns out you hire more women when you raise your standards, uh, <laughs> contrary uh, to some of the myths. But we've also invested... How does that work? Uh, just, yes. just out of interest. Absolutely. Right. So there's this myth in the tech industry that the tech industry is a meritocracy. Um, but actually, all the research says that that's not true. Uh, research says that when you believe uh, that you're working in a meritocracy, you actually are more likely to be biased and discriminatory. So the way that we've increased uh, the number of women and other uh, minorities at Atlassian, right, uh, diversity is not just about gender. Um, it's we've instituted objective hiring criteria. We've gotten rid of this concept called culture fit, uh, which is really just an intractable morass of unconscious bias. Um, and we've also, frankly, tried to change our culture in a way that's more supportive of a wide variety of people coming to work and being successful. Do you have, in doing that, do you have to change the entire culture of the tech industry? Because it's male-dominated. Um, look at Silicon Valley. It's yeah. remarkable how many men are involved at the top levels of virtually every company. It's true. I mean, but there are ways to work on that. So we use something called the diverse slate approach. Um, and we do that for our board of directors. We do that all all the way through the directors in our company. That means that we require that a balanced slate of candidates, qualified, interested candidates, be considered for every open leadership role at Atlassian. And I can tell you that it works because 40% of the leaders that we've hired over the last year identify as female, right? Right, it's, it's science. Um, and that's what we're doing. And it's not just women, for example, that we've raised the representation of. Uh, we've raised the representation of folks over 40, because uh, ageism is the elephant in the room. Um, and in our US offices, we've also significantly increased uh, the representation of black and Hispanic uh, technical workers, um, who are often the most marginalized in the US tech industry. But the fact is, it's a long road. And Atlassian, we can't do it on our own. But we are trying to take the captain's seat, especially in Australian tech, to paint the, the vision of the future. But when I say, what can you do? Learn how to code. Or if that doesn't sound interesting, we also have lots of non-technical jobs, right? I don't code that well. I'm still there. Simon, what do you think? Um, over my last five years at Stanford, um, something pretty remarkable was happening. It was this diversification of industry placements into the, into the tech industry. Um, it was less boys with toys who could code and increasingly um, there are, there are, as, the, as the mission scope of companies like Facebook and Apple, Google has expanded, so too is the demand for skill sets that aren't in, in domains that are traditionally where, where men go and, 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 and do well. So that, that's point number one. The tech industry itself, by virtue of what it does, is changing. So there's a supply side argument there, if you will. But the other thing to reflect on is just, again, drawing my experience in higher ed, is that, look, diversity just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to learn more about, about, you know, so often in hiring situations, good fit, good match with the culture. Well, that's code, right? And, you, and you've got to call that out. What do you mean by that? And indeed, perhaps put in rules where you, that's not a valid argument here. Like, what, unpack that. What are you saying when you say that? Give me a reason. And so I want to learn more about that, about that. <laughs> yeah, Michael, um, I'll bring you in here too, because um, what would you say to this young woman who's looking at a future in this country, um, trying to uh, make her way possibly, or maybe her friends will, into this world um, that's been so dominated by men? You're running a university. What's your answer? Um, so we are seeing more and more women in science and the um, uh, SAGE project is particularly about increasing the diversity of women in science faculties. We're now at a position as a university where we have um, between uh, Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Deans and Heads of University Schools, 50% women, 50% men and I think that's how it begins. We've consciously worked to um, uh, uh, increase the number of women professors across the disciplines but particularly in science means that we've had to think about career structure for people at the university, thinking about being more flexible and all the rest of it. 
I think there's never been a better time to be a young woman interested in a scientific career than now in, in Australia. So you're hitting it at just the right spot. OK, we've got a little time left. We've got time for one last question. It comes from Brandon Sharp. As an American who has been living in Australia, I have watched the same thinly veiled racist and xenophobic rhetoric that gave rise to Trump develop in the public discourse here. Using America as a cautionary tale, what can be done to subvert this trend by people in positions of power in the corporate, political and academic world? Let's start with the political world. Linda. Mm -hmm. Look, that's a very good question. And I think it starts, starts at the top, but it also starts at the bottom. And I don't think we have the same issues with racism. In fact, I'm confident we don't have the same issues with racism here in Australia. <coughs> but we need to make sure that where we find it, whether it's at the schoolyard, whether it's in, in politics, anywhere we find it, we've got to call it out and make sure that it doesn't grow. But the one point I would make is that sometimes when we try to suppress and when other people don't listen to what other people are saying, we can un in a, uh, unintentionally suppress racist thoughts and views and things go underground. So I think in a, in a funny way, it's better to actually bring these comments out and kill them and knock them down. So for me, I don't think there's one single sol solution but I certainly hope that your experience hasn't been one of a racist Australia. Now, um, knowing your um, three decades, more or less, of, um, of Army Reserve, of, of being an officer in the Army Reserve, I'm just wondering your reaction when you saw that photograph recently of an of a Army vehicle in action um, in Afghanistan flying a Nazi flag. Mm. Well, Tony, that was completely inappropriate, but I would point out that it was uh, 11 years ago and as soon as it was identified, the chain of command took it down and the appropriate action was taken. But does it, that has it, no does, place Does it in suggest, the I mean, we're, we're also seeing mm. now all sorts of things happening within the SAS and so on, but does it suggest mm. there may be a hidden culture within the army that is overtly racist? Mm. No, I don't think so. But what I do think is that there's 80,000 men and women serving in uniform, serving us all in uniform with great distinction today. So if the allegations that we've all heard that are horrific allegations, if the investigations prove that they are correct, those people deserve to have the full force of military law thrown at them. But it is so important when we're talking about this that we don't inadvertently tar the reputations of the 80,000 men and women who are serving in uniform and doing extraordinary things for us every day. And I know from my experience that the vast majority do not share those thoughts and certainly have a culture of service and a dedication to Australia that has no place, no place for that sort of behaviour. OK, and uh, I'll, Tim, I'll bring you in. And the broader question there, the, in fact, the question was, um, using America as a cautionary tale, what can be done to subvert the trend uh, towards racism? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd agree with Linda to the extent that I don't think we have the same issues with race as America. We have a different history to America. But absolutely, we have issues with race in Australia. I mean, uh, as I was saying earlier, I mean, our, our founding story is a founding story of nation building through the prism of white Australia, explicitly through the prism of white Australia. I mean, when we think about Russell Ward's Australian legend, that image is of a white man working on the land. Um, and, and that was what we used to create a vision of Australia. And that's the story of my family. I mean, my family arrived here in the 1840s. I have ancestors who are involved in the anti-Chinese leagues on the goldfields. I have ancestors involved in uh, pre-Federation parliaments that passed uh, anti-miscegenation laws um, and, and the, the founding, uh, the pre preceding laws to the White Australia policy. I have ancestors who are trade unionists who were involved in uh, anti-immigration committees. Um, but the fantastic thing about Australia is that we overcame that nation building. So I can look back at my ancestors who were involved in that. And today, you know, my wife is a Hong Kong Chinese migrant. My kids are Eurasian Australians. And I can have a conversation about them, about how their ancestor didn't want them to be a part of the story of Australia, to be a part of the future of Australia. But that's OK, because we got past that. We grew as a country and we're a far greater country as a result today. I'm just going to quickly go back to our questioner, uh, Brandon. Uh, Briefly, what is it that you've seen here uh, that makes you think we're going down that dark path? Um, I think there's a, a broad trend of, um, as Linda said, sort of sweeping under the rug and not actually addressing the topic yeah. and calling it racist, calling it what it is. And I think 
because Australia is smaller and has things like the ABC that are publicly funded and the Q and Q and A, there's an opportunity to uh, approach and um, deal with things more head on. And that's was as much a question as a challenge to okay. you all. I think that's I think that's really important. The point about um, talking. We know that Australia is racist. Every country is racist. People use categories to put other people's people down all the way across the world. We know that in Australia, from work that's just been done by the university, that you are um, three times more likely to get an interview with exactly the same CV if you've got a, an English forename and an English surname to if you've got a Chinese forename and a Chinese surname. And that you are somewhere in the middle if you have a English um, forename and a Chinese surname. We know that on work that was done at the university out of 2000, with 2,500 leaders in Australia, um, across all the sectors, even though 25% of them are a non-European ethnicity, only just over 2% of them, um, of over, even though 25% of people in the population are of non-European ethnicity, just over 2% of the leaders were of non-European ethnicity. This is a racist country, just like every other country. And the problem is that we as Australians don't talk about it. We either say we don't have a problem with racism, a la Linda, or we say we used to have a problem with racism, but we don't anymore because now we're really nice. Right? And okay. it's just not true. We need to be grown up and say, actually, this is a challenge for our country if we genuinely believe that we are one, but we are many, and from many lands we come, and we need to be better at it. And it requires the kind of work that T Simon was talking about that we've done in the gender space. Now in Australia, we need to do it in relation to cultural and linguistic diversity. So, so, Michael, I, I Sorry, I, OK, well, very briefly, because we're over I, time now, so... What I'm not know? saying that Australia doesn't have issues with race today. What I'm saying is, how do we talk about that? We can say we've come an enormous distance as a country in a positive way. We still have a long way to go. But the way that we talk about that story shows the potential for change in Australia. I heard you saying very thing. similar things, in fact. So, Aubrey. But I think, um, so, as, as a Mexican-American, yes, we do come in this colour. Um, I have, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have actually a very interesting, right, relationship with racism, because if you don't know, you don't know. Uh, so things get said in front of me uh, that might shock you. But I think one of the things that America has made a mistake on that I hope Australia doesn't is, you know, after the 1950s and the civil rights, we were like, oh, racism's over. And now it's gone underground. It became insidious. It began to eat away, right? Racism is America's original sin. And now we've seen that not talking about it mm -hmm. actually led to this bursting forth that we now see in Trumpism, which is open, virulent racism. But I think, and I'm going back to this point, and it comes from, you know, Karl Popper's theories of open society, is that, yes, we should acknowledge that racism is real, but that there must be social costs for, for expressing outright bigotry, right? That is how we do it, is that we form our social norms around that. Um, you know, the quote that always sits with me is, the only thing that it takes for evil to prevail is for good men and women and non-binary people to do nothing. <laughs> And so we have to be willing to stand up and define what are the norms in our society. And that means acknowledging what's wrong with it. Simon, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Michael Spence, Tim Watts, Aubrey Blanche, Simon Jackman and Linda Reynolds. Thank you very much. And you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes is joined by former High Court Justice Michael Kirby. Now, next Monday night, something completely different, a Q&A special with a focus on disability. The NDIS has been a major game-changer, but there are some teething problems. Not everyone is benefiting. Uh, joining our panel, wheelchair tennis and basketball champion and broadcaster Dylan Olcott. Uh, disability advocate and actress with dwarfism, uh, Kirina Stammel. Former Disability Discrimination Commissioner Graham Innes, founding father of the NDIS, now director of the Melbourne Disability Institute, uh, Bruce bon Bonahady, and parent and carer, uh, Katia Malakias. Until next Monday, good night.